Coming up on this week's Outdoor Elements. I'm Evie Kirkwood from St. Joseph County Parks. And I'm Marie Laudeman from the Indiana Dune State Park. And on today's show, we are at Indiana Dunes State Park, where we get to band a goldfinch. And we'll learn a little bit of how to identify them, which will be great. We're also going to try to find an insect called an ant lion who walks backwards. And then we'll get to experience the Dunes Prairie Unit and how our resource manager here takes care of this habitat. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana State Parks. and we're at Indiana Dunes State Park to learn a little bit about a bird you might be familiar with at your bird feeders. It's the goldfinch and I'm with Marie and we're going to chat with Brad Baumgartner. He's the executive director mm -hmm. of yeah. Indiana Audubon. Absolutely. One of the things that you do is help people learn about birds and their habits mm -hmm. And you're a bird bander, which is a great tool to help people learn more about birds, right? Yeah, we do a lot of work with uh, bird conservation education, so bird banding becomes a natural extension of the education in addition to the research, too. So it is August. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that limits the kinds of birds that you might actually bird band, but goldfinches mm -hmm. are still pretty active this time of year, right? Yeah, we're at the end of the season, so you don't have as much bird activity. Things are slowing down with the nesting, but goldfinches are just ramping up, so it's a great time to be able to see them at your feeders. Great. So you actually have a bird that was caught mm -hmm. in one of the bird banding nets, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Let's find out if, if it's a male or a female and how yeah. we tell so them Yeah, so as apart. part of our banding this morning, we're able to capture one of these goldfinches, and right. there's so much that we can learn. And obviously the first thing we want to do is be able to get the bird out. So very carefully, I'm going to reach in here, and they're not very big birds. No. And they're going to fit just right inside my Little hand. hand yeah. So I'm going to pull them out and actually oh, get yep, screaming the little bird. a grip on it. And so you may hear some chatter. You may see him bite me. You may see him poop me. So <laughs> he's not a hurt right? bird. I would do the same Just thing an angry where... bird is what we have here today. And so there's a little better grip than we can actually see right, this great. goldfinch. So male, female. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at some of the different measurements and they'll actually tell us by looking at the plumage patterns, whether it's a male or female. Most folks know they're really bright goldfinches are the mm -hmm. males. So right away, this is kind of looking like a female, but we don't know that yet. Okay. And so what we'll do is I'm going to get a little grip on this bird so it won't fly away. And what I'm doing here is I don't want the, the wings to be flapping. That might be how it hurts right, itself. Right. And so we have the license to be able to do this banding on the condition that we let it go unharmed during this process. And so uh, I'm recording all the data. It's gonna go to the bird banding laboratory. And so we're gonna start by taking some basic measurements. And one of the things I'm gonna look at is the length of the wing. And we're doing that in millimeters. So we have 69 millimeters for the wing. We're gonna do the tail as well. So we know that we're about 45 millimeters. So I'm actually gonna write that down here in our sheet, 69. And I said 45, right, yeah, good, there good we listening. go. So we're gonna get some of that basic information here about the birds. And then we can actually look at how old this bird is and whether it's a boy or a girl. And for these goldfinches, we can do two ages. You either were born this year or you were later. Once you turn two, three, four, five, you look the same. Mm -hmm. And so what we're gonna do is look at a couple things. And one of them, I'm gonna open this wing up and I'm not hurting a bird at all, just kind of opening up it's their wing. It's just kind of like when we unfold our arms. Exactly, right? yeah. And what we can see here is you can see the color of these different feathers. We have our primary feathers and our, our secondary feathers. I can also see the back. And look at that olive color. It's contrasting with a lot of these brighter yellow that you might think of on more like a male, and especially on this underside here, you can see some of that yellow. Hmm. One of the things that we can do is take a look not only at the wing, but at this tail pattern that we see right here. Very cool. So what are we exactly looking for in these tail feathers? What we're seeing on this sheet is it actually shows me four different types of tails going from the youngest males to the oldest males with females in between. And so what we can look at is the extent of white that's on the tip of this feather. And it's something you may not see when you're seeing a bird perched in a tree, but with a bird in the hand, we can see that and see that it's definitely not a young female, but it's not the white extent we see on an adult male. So using that pattern with the 
this end of the wing that we see here, I'm gently pulling out, we can see that color pattern. This tells us it's an adult female. Okay, yeah, good, very good. So you're gonna go ahead and, and process the bird, is mm -hmm. what we call it, right? To yeah. actually band it? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what we're doing, we're kind of recording some of the stuff. So here I'm gonna write down that it's, a, it's an after hatch here, it's a female bird. We've taken some of the basic measurements and then our banding books actually tell us what size of band they use too. And so that's what I'm going to do next is to pull out a different band and we're going to put that on his foot or on her foot that is. All right. So I'm going to pull it out here. Little tiny bands for little tiny goldfinches. And what I'm doing, I'm going to take the pliers and they will open up that band. So they get pretty good at doing a lot of stuff one handed. <laughs> one handed, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> And then this little tiny band has a nine digit number that'll give that bird an identity. And these are special, this is a special tool, right? Mm -hmm. A special tool that grips that band just in the right yeah, position. Yeah, so you see that we got these special holes that won't allow us to close that band up too tight. It'll fit just right around that bird's foot, kind of like a, a watch fits on us. So it should be a little bit loose. And all I'm gonna do is just pinch it down there. And now our goldfinch has her bling on her. Wow. So she's gonna wear this jewelry the rest of her life. This could be anywhere from two to three years to nine, ten years on some of these birds. Wow. So you'll, you'll probably have a chance maybe to see this bird at your feeders, right? Yeah. yeah. Do this, which will be really cool. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know some of the other things that you do, you weigh the bird, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And, but I also, can we can we put that bird back in a bag? Because I want to talk about the nest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep, and, we can finish up with her here in a is. second. Yeah. Put her back in the bag here, and it kind of uh, will we'll reduce the stress levels for the bird. So kind of like being uh, uh, having blinders on a horse or a falcon. And so it's like a bird hammock as well. It is, yep. <laughs> yep, it'll kind of rest in there for a while before we let it go. Okay. Great, Brad. Well, we've talked a lot about the characteristics of the goldfinch. Mm -hmm. They're nesting late mm -hmm. summer like we are right mm -hmm. now. Can you tell us more about special features of these nests that they yeah, have? Yeah, what makes goldfinches really cool is that they're the last breeders every year. So when all these birds are done raising their young, the goldfinches are just starting. And so they're going to start their nest uh, tied with the thistle plant that we see, kind of the native thistles that are out there. And so goldfinches, by nesting in August, are the only bird in Indiana that feeds its young seeds. Mm, Every other wow. bird is using insects or berries, but goldfinches specialize just in seed. So we have the native thistle, or at your feeders, mm -hmm. we have the, the niger, yeah. which kind of looks a little bit like mouse poop, but it's not. <laughs> and what we have here is um, actually a special seed. This is uh, called niger. It's actually grown uh, in Africa. It's an African daisy that's uh, real popular, which is why you pay a little more because it's being imported in. But goldfinches love it, and it's great for your feeders, and it lasts a little longer than our native thistle might. But their native food would be thistle seeds. Yep, thistle or, plants. Yeah. Yep, you have your bull thistle, swamp thistle. And they'll actually even take some of their nests and line it with some of the down from the yeah. thistle plant. That's so it's great. almost, they're, they're really tied to this plant. It's a really small kind of grass knit uh, uh, nest as well mm. that can uh, easily be uh, uh, not seen in some of the different gold, golden rods and other shrubs. Because they nest down low. They down low, yep, high. they're not up in the treetops. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So late late fall, early winter, you can actually sometimes find yep, these. Yep, out in September you might, might see these yeah. as things are browning. All right, great. Mm -hmm. Well, Neat. thanks for helping us learn about goldfinches. No problem. They are sweet little birds Neat that bird. many people mm -hmm. can hopefully see at their summer feeders or even their winter feeders when they look kind of yep, drab. Yep, they drab change olive. colors. It's a really neat bird that does that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we'll have more information on the Outdoor Elements website about goldfinches and about Indiana Audubon. And as well, we'll have a link if you ever find a banded bird, what you should do. I am here with Brad Bumgardner from the Indiana Audubon. He is working on a banding research project and he has a cardinal here to show <laughs> As you us. can hear, we do, yeah. Cardinal's a little more of the feistier bird, so thanks for a great uh, state bird here in Indiana. And we have been banding some birds this morning and we happen to have catched a, uh, or caught a female cardinal. And so she is not happy about it, but she's not being hurt at all in this process. And we're going to take some measurements here, we're going to put a little band on her and then let her go. Can record down today's date that we banded her, where we banded her at Indiana Dune State Park. And once we got all the information, the last thing I'm going to do is weigh her. Forty-two, and then we are all done, and we can let her go. Wow. 
We are inside the busy Indiana Dunes State Park Nature Center on a summer day to learn about one of my favorite insects, and it's called an antlion. And to help us learn about it, I'm with Ashley Heilman, and you are an interpretive naturalist yes. here at Indiana Dunes State Park. And you've kind of taken a liking to these critters, right? Yes, yeah. very much so. So right above our head is a giant model mm -hmm. of an adult Antlion. Yes. And I bet you get a lot of folks who say, well, it looks like a dragonfly. Yeah, definitely. What's the difference? So most people kind of confuse it with a damselfly. Okay, um, similar to a dragonfly. Right, yeah. right, definitely. Um, but there's a few differences that you can tell. So one would be looking for these antenna. Um, they have little clubbed antenna at the very front, whereas the damselfly, the dragonfly might not have that. Right. Um, they're also poor flyers compared to the damselfly. They're nocturnal, which the damselfly is not and they're also a part of the lace wing family. Excellent, and they do have beautiful lacy, yes, lacy, lacy, very translucent pretty. wings, right? Exactly, right. yes. All right, great, so very, very cool adult insect. But also, the larva is what's really kind of charming in Definitely. its little cuddly way. Yeah. This is another giant model. Yes. And uh, it's like, you know, really a tiny thing. Very right? much so, yes. Okay. And we're actually in a little bit, we're gonna go out and look for the traps for these. Yeah. Um, but, you know, some characteristics about this guy, it's a real predator, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, definitely a predator insect, um, and they go through the full stage of metamorphosis, you know, egg, larva, uh, pupa, and then winged adult. Okay, and actually right here in the Nature Center you have yes. a great model, right? Yes, very good model. And so it shows the pupa on, in the sand. Yes. And a trap that the larva Yes. Creates. Exactly, right? yes. So we're gonna go outside on the trail, I think. Yeah. And we're gonna right, we're gonna look to see if we can find a trap. Yes. And then maybe find one of these little guys. Hopefully, yes. Under the sand. Yes. Okay, good. Well let's uh, let's grab some gear and head out on the trail. Sounds good. All right, so we're kind of just along the trail and we're looking for like a little hole, right? Yeah, and we've got one actually oh. right here too. Okay. We wanna take a look at it. Oh wow. So how big is this funnel trap? that this little antlion makes? So they can get um, about two inches wide by two inches deep. This one's obviously not that a big. A little smaller. But yeah. Okay, and what are they collecting or what, you know, what, what insects are they eating? So mainly it's ants. Um, but hence antlion. Hence the right. ant, exactly. Okay, um, but really any smaller insects, sometimes even spiders, anything that's really gonna get trapped in there that he can catch. Oh, look, there's an ant. There's yeah, there's an ant. he just like, missed oh, it. I know. The wrong way. Right. <laughs> but basically what happens is the ant would crawl down into the shaped funnel part yes. that we can see. Right. And then does that cause like the, probably the sand to slip a little bit? Right, so if we get an ant in there, the ant will start to try to get out and the sand will move underneath him and the antlion will feel that also and he'll come out a little and use his head to throw some sand on the ant creating wow. like an avalanche effect oh wow and wait for that ant to fall down so he can grab him that's great yeah right. let's see if we can find some more because I, I this is like great a habitat, good area right? yeah okay, for sure right. we're looking for a little little funnel yeah they're tiny and it rained here recently it did, so yeah. there's some raindrops there. yes it's a little yeah. little harder and I'm assuming that they wouldn't be in this hard, compacted soil. Right, I yes. Mean, and people walk here, too, so they kind of try to stay away from that. Okay, all right, great. And you've got some gear here, so... Yeah, yeah, for sure, but we have some over here oh, as well. Oh, right, here's some. Okay. So, is that yes. one? Yes, that guy's one. This guy over here is oh, one. Oh, that's a tiny one. Yes, it's right? an itty-bitty one. And we've got some hiding under here because of the rain as well. Wow. I know, very okay. cool. Sometimes these are called doodle bugs. Why is that? Yeah, so the larvae are sometimes referred to as doodle bugs because um, this insect walks backwards um, and he kind of walks in a wobbly fashion creating these these lines in the sand. Okay, and we are in really sandy soil. Yes. Are they always found in a sandy habitat? For the most part they're commonly found in the sand, um, but any really loose soil type, you can find them as long as they can make their traps. So even like around, could I find them around my house if I had Yeah, no, okay. definitely, okay. for All sure. Right. Good, okay. So you've got some gear here. Yes. What are we gonna do? We are going to dig for some antlions, see if we can okay. show you. So you've actually pre-collected some? I have pre-collected a few for you, oh, yes. Okay, so we get to see, actually see how big they are. Yeah, right? okay. definitely. All right, so we're gonna each grab one of Yeah, these? sure. Right, let's see if we can do this. Okay. Can you kind of tell me what to do here? So, and um, let me ask, how'd you collect these? So I went yesterday and uh, used our little sift here, uh -huh. and we, we found some that were kind of underneath like, like that, mm -hmm. right, because it rained, and we scooped them up, sifted them through, and 
and threw them in their new here. habitat. Yes. And this is something that you would do for a public program yes. here at the state park yep. so people could actually see them. Okay, Definitely. Great. All right, so what am I going to do? Um, just take your sifter. You've yeah. got a lot more sand than I do. Yeah. So maybe start sifting. Just if you scooping. see movement, yeah, usually that helps too. Okay. We'll see if we can find now these. Here. These we saw the gigantic model. Right. <laughs> but the actual ant lion is not very big, right? No, he's only about uh, a half an inch long. It's about oh, as big oh, as they can oh, get. Look, is oh, it you it? found him! Oh, yeah, he's taking back in the. Yeah, he's going backwards. Oh, let me see if I can scoop him up. Yeah, definitely. Whoa. All right, that is so fun. They, you know, lions, they, they kind of look more like teddy bears. Yes, them, right? yes. If you look so up close to He's going to be in here. So let's see. Might have to. <laughs> oh, we oh, can even look, put him in your hands. In, yeah, can I? Yeah, for sure. That's right. That's him right there in the yes, center. Yes, that's him. Yep. <laughs> and they are covered with little hairs. Ooh, he's yes, clinging. yes, he's clinging. Oh, look at that. He's very cute. And they do walk backwards, which is just so bizarre. It's adorable. Right? Yeah, definitely. Wow. Do these guys only um, make their little funnels in the late summer? Does it matter what time of year? It's usually summertime, just because the sand is you know driest then. Um, Do they always use the same hole? They're moving around. They get, can they if somebody steps on their hole, they can make another one. Right. right? They will definitely okay. make make new ones. Okay. Wow. Look at that. Just walking backward. And Ooh, I'm assuming these little almost like pinchers are what they would grab and Yeah, so it's mandibles. Yeah, so that's what he's going to grab onto the ant and uh, suck out his insides. It is really <laughs> bizarre that they only walk backwards, I know, right? it's cute. It, <laughs> <laughs> Let me get it back down yeah, here. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so if people wanted to um, attract, like can you actually attract ant lions to your yard? You know, if you've got lots of insects, I'm sure they would be there. Okay. Um, and it's really Whoops. as long as, ooh, you dropped it. <laughs> exactly. And maybe even, like, you could maybe even set some sandy soil. Yeah, as long as you have that looser soil, I'm sure they'll come to you. I bet if I put some, oh, you look, see, he's yeah, trying he's to do Yeah, he's going under right? already. I'm going to yep. try to do that again so folks can see that. Yeah. He can actually, uh, hang on. Do you want me to hold him for a second? Yeah, yeah. and I'll get a scoop of sand. Okay, and then yeah, and then we'll put them on you. You can make, actually, people can see how he actually tunnels into the sand. All right. Like right there. Look at that. It doesn't take Moving a long. His, no, he knows exactly what he's doing. Wow. Moving that body backwards underneath the sand. And perfectly camouflaged. No, yeah. Right? It's so hard to see him even just here. Yeah, look at that. Wow, that is great. Well, if folks want to learn more about antlions, I know that you do a summer pro summer yes. program at Indiana Dune State Park frequently yeah. at the Nature Center. And folks can come. So we'll make sure on the Outdoor Elements website that we link to the Indiana Dunes State Park website. That sounds great, yeah. So folks can come to one of the programs and actually do what we just did, which yeah. was a blast, right? Perfect, yes. All right, thanks for helping us learn You're about welcome. these great little critters. Yeah, for sure. It's a beautiful day here at the Indiana Dunes State Park. And the Indiana Dunes are really known for their diverse habitats. And I am here with Doug Bodka, who is the resource manager for the Indiana Dunes State Park. We're here in the Dunes Prairie Unit, Doug, and tell us what characterizes the uniqueness of this habitat. Well, thank you, Marie. We picked a great day to come and illustrate it because this is what prairies and savannas are all about. And that's what makes up the Dunes Prairie Nature Preserve, are savannas um, and prairies, both of which are very sunny and very open habitats. They um, also share another similarity, and that's that they are normally maintained by fire. They evolved with fire being a major force in their development and in their maintenance. Very good. And so what would be the difference between, say, the savanna part and the prairie part? Well, this is looking more like prairie. Um, normally prairies are relatively treeless. Uh, savannas will have tree cover, but they still have about 10% to 80% sunlight coming through. Um, so prairies will be more open. Savannas will definitely have that tree cover and mostly oaks like what we're seeing here. And when I think of a prairie, I quite often will think of tall grasses and tall plants. Um, everything around here seems to be a little bit shorter. Yeah. Is that a characteristic of a, the Indiana Dunes Prairie Unit? Well, so we do have some of the same grasses as you'll see in those taller prairies. Um, but because of the, the soil substrate, we don't have um, as many of the taller plants coming through. And also, um, we have a lot of different uh, grasses, such as, uh, there's one called June grass, 
that is perhaps the dominant grass out here. And it's a much shorter grass, only about two feet tall. Interesting. So I see around us that there are lots of beautiful flowers. Mm -hmm. Is late August, like right now, a good time to see some of these flowering plants? Well, this is a great time to come, but really any time is a good time to come out and see plants because we effectively have a, a continuum of wildflowers blooming from April when the bird's foot violets will start blooming. Then we have downy phlox coming on and we have coreopsis which kind of gets us to this sec section. And then we'll also have things like asters. Cool, well, let's take a look at something that's flowering beautifully right near, right now, right in front of us. Mm -hmm. Can you introduce us to this plant? Well, this is probably one that, that many people might know. And this is called bergamot, wild bergamot or bee balm. It's officially a monarda. And you do see it a lot in different habitats, but one of the great things about it is it's frequented by many pollinators. So there are upwards of 20 different butterflies that come to this, as well as hummingbirds, bees, uh, even beetles will come here. Very so cool. it's, a great, it's a great plant for pollinators, and, and we love seeing it all the time. And this is a plant, too, that um, are common in other prairie units and all across the Yes, Indiana you even well. see it in openings in woodlands sometimes, but it definitely is thriving out here. And does it have kind of a minty smell if we were to rub it and smell it? It does indeed, and I believe you can make tea from it if you, Ooh, if you really yeah. wanted. Yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look. Is there another beautiful flower here close by that we can take we a have, look at? We have one over here, and it's called the cylindrical blazing star. Okay. Some people call it the dwarf blazing star. And you'll start seeing them. They're just starting to bloom. Beautiful. And they are a little bit shorter. Um, what This is what's called a compound flower. So each flower head has individual tube flowers. So there'll be approximately 20, 30 tube flowers in each head that's blooming. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And pollinators love this as oh, well. Oh my gosh. It's um, both this and there's also another liatris, another blazing star that we have out here, the rough blazing star. And both of those are, you'll see butterflies on them constantly once they start blooming. Very cool. Yes. And so here um, there are over how many different species would you say growing in just this dunes prairie? Well, I did a little count and we have over 140 native species. Wow. And um, surprisingly, 20 of them are native grasses. And are some of them listed as endangered or very rare to find? The Indiana DNR does um, listings of endangered and threatened plants. And we have seven of them in this bowl area that are listed by the state. All right, let's go take a look at one of those plants. Okay, sure. All right, Doug. So on our walk over here, we saw a really interesting plant called bearberry. Can you tell us more about that plant? Well, sure. It actually is a northern species which finds its southern, uh, this is as far south as it'll go. And um, it's a low growing woody shrub and it's actually state rare. So it's one of those great plants to see out here. Yeah, and so with all of these plants, you said over 130 species that you know of mm -hmm. in this whole Dunes Prairie unit, how, what's your job to manage this area? How do you take care of this? Well, one of our prime jobs is uh, getting fire back into the environment. And this habitat evolved with fire all, almost all of these plants are, um, they've evolved with fire being their, their major focus. And we even have some that are fire dependent. Yeah, and we have one right back here, correct? This is called the jack pine. Yes. And on this tree, it has cones like other pines do. Mm -hmm. um, but tell us a little bit about how these are special. Well, these, these uh, cones will not release normally until fire hits them. And so the intense heat is what opens up and All will right. let, let the seeds go. Can we try it? Sure. Okay. All right, I'm gonna give a little bit of heat ignition to it and we'll see if it opens up similar to the cone right next to it. Hey, a little bit. You can really see it on this one that we burned earlier as well. Uh -huh. Very good. So, Doug, this is a very special habitat. Like we talked about state endangered plants. Um, why should people care about the Dunes Prairie Unit at the Indiana Dunes State Park? Well, it's first off a great place to visit because there are so many wildflower species out here. Um, 
It also is great for pollinators. So you can see all kinds of butterflies, moths, and it's, uh, again, just a nice habitat because it's so diverse. Yeah, and so if you would like to come out and visit the Dunes Prairie Unit, you can visit the Indiana Dunes State Park by parking on the west side of the beach and hiking along Trail 3. This is in a nature preserve, so it is important that you visit it from the trail, and you can find out more by visiting the Outdoor Elements website. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Outdoor Elements, where we experienced banding a goldfinch, we went on an antlion safari, and we got to experience the beautiful Dunes Nature Preserve. And remember, you can find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. We'll see you next time. For more information on this and other episodes, go to the Outdoor Elements website at wnit.org backslash outdoor elements. Catch up on recent episodes and find additional resources like hands-on activities and informational PDFs. It's one more way to help you find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. Elements is made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.